know he has a question and I would call on him. It's a little different than the emojis. It's a, it's a raised hand. And if for some reason that doesn't work for you, you can always just wave at the screen and I'll, I'll look at you and I'll find you there. So, um, but tonight, why don't we start with prayer? Lord Jesus, we uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to come together, even though we're so far apart. We ask you to be with us tonight as we take a few minutes to study your word and, and read about the gospel according to St. Matthew. Um, help us, Lord, to, to see in uh, the words of scripture the testimony about you, the Christ, the Son of God. We ask it in your name. Amen. Okay, well, if you have Bibles, you're going to want to have them open to Matthew chapter 1, because we're going to take a look today at the very first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew, and I think it's a fascinating study because of um, how, of, of the role that Matthew plays between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'm going to share my screen here for a second and show you a little bit of what we're uh, show you a little bit of what we're going to be following along with today. Sorry, I just knocked over my other machine. So, and uh, so hopefully you will get to see our handout for tonight. So the Gospel according to St. Matthew, of course, the author of the book of Matthew, we would say is Matthew, although he doesn't identify himself at all in that way. He does not identify who, who is the author of this gospel, but already in the 100s AD, so uh, within the lifetime of the apostles, uh, the, uh, this gospel had been attributed to Matthew or Levi, the tax collector. And uh, so, uh, uh, for example, the church father Papias, who was someone who lived in oh, about 100 AD, uh, he was somebody who was known as a disciple of the apostle John. And he talked about that this gospel according to St. Matthew was written by Levi, by Matthew, his other name. And it was written for the people that were Palestinian Christians. So, for example, if you remember, each of the gospels, there's four gospels, and each of them were written with slightly different audiences or intentions in mind. So, for example, the gospel according to St. Mark, um, Mark was a disciple of Peter. So, Mark, gospel of Mark is usually called Peter's gospel. And it was written for Christians living in the Italian peninsula in Rome. And one of the interesting things you can see about that is because uh, the gospel according to Mark was written for the people living in Italy, every time there's a, uh, oh, um, a reference to something having to do with Jewish tradition, uh, Mark will stop and explain it to the, to the Romans. Whereas Matthew, Matthew wrote in the area where the Christians uh, were predominantly from a Jewish background, whether that was actually in Palestine here, or sometimes we think it might've been up a little bit more into Asia Minor as well. But one of the things that you'll see in his, uh, in his gospel is you will see, number one, he won't explain Jewish traditions or Jewish practices because his assumption, of course, is that the people there are going to, are, are going to know um, what he's talking about. And uh, the, one of the key parts of that audience with Matthew is Matthew was someone who obviously was, um, he was a Jewish man. He grew up going to synagogue. Uh, he would have been one of the uh, very few people, well, one of the relatively few people who were literate because of his, his job as a tax collector. Of course, as a tax collector, it also meant that he was going to be uh, a complete outsider from his own people because he'd have been seen as a traitor. Um, and when he was called to faith in Jesus and called to discipleship, his whole life changed. And his, uh, and his, uh, the, the nature of his gospel is such that we get to see um, Matthew's Jewish roots in an especially unique way. Because if you think about it, Matthew is placed for um, the first of the four gospels, not necessarily because it was written first. We don't know exactly when each of them was written, but Matthew wasn't placed there um, as the first book of the New Testament because of the chronology of his book. It's going to be more about the features of his book that we're going to take a look at here again. So I'm going to go back and, uh, and uh, drop back onto my screen here. I think there's a way for me not to have to jump back and forth like that, but I'll figure this out eventually. Um, the biggest thing about Matthew that we're going to take a look at is, yes, he has features like uh, he works with the discourses of Jesus, a focus on Jesus' royalty, um, 
an expression that he uses all the time is the kingdom of heaven. But really, Old Testament fulfillment is what Jesus, uh, is what Matthew is all about, especially when it comes down to his, uh, to uh, the way in which he's going to show us how the Old Testament and the New Testament fit together. So one of the things is really interesting in the book of Matthew, he has um, 55 references to the Old Testament. So that he quotes the Old Testament 55 times, whereas Mark, Luke, and John all together have 65 total. And so Matthew is uh, very much more about seeing the Old Testament. 12 times Matthew says, um, talks about that the Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus. And so there's a reason why Matthew's gospel was first. And the reason Matthew's gospel was first, of course, is because his was the gospel that was the most natural connection between the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures. Because here was this, uh, the, this gospel that showed that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Jesus is the fulfillment of each one of these, uh, these, uh, these prophecies. And it is the gospel that most clearly and most frequently links it back to the Old Testament. And uh, I think uh, I want to take a look at a couple of examples of that when we think about the way in which the gospel opens and uh, look at the idea of how Matthew builds the narrative of his gospel around the idea of fulfillment. So I'm going to sh share my screen one more time, and I want you to follow with me through a couple parts of Matthew's gospel. All right, so like if we take a look at the gospel according to St. Matthew, if you take a look at the very first, uh, the very first words uh, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Um, that's actually uh, a, uh, when you read it in Greek, it's the Biblios Genios. Uh, so it's the word for Genesis. Um, it talks about, the, here's the beginning of the story of Jesus. And uh, Matthew makes an obvious reference, an allusion back to the uh, book of Genesis, where he's going to tie this in, that God in his purposes towards his people started at the very beginning of mankind's time in history, and it came to its, con its conclusion in the genealogy or in the, in the birth of Jesus the Messiah. So you're going to see here, first of all, he walks us through the genealogy of uh, Jesus from Abraham down to David in verse 6. That's the first set. And then from David down to the exile in Babylon. That's the second set. And from the Babylon until the birth of Jesus, who's called the Messiah. That's the third set. And the way in which he uh, is going to structure this, this uh, uh, genealogy is that there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Um, so he's, he's setting up something really important here. I'm going to come back to the genealogy part. Um, but first, I want you to take a look at a couple of uh, places in which we see this fulfillment uh, in a very specific way. So this is Matthew's gospel opens with that chapter in genealogy. And then the very th first thing that happens is the first fulfillment that Jesus brings up is in Matthew chapter one, verse 18, um, where this is how the birth of Jesus came about. Look, especially at uh, verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. Um, so the genealogy that we just read shows without a doubt that Jesus was a man who was descended from Abraham, who was from the royal uh, Davidic line, right? But uh, here we see that the very first thing that happens is um, he points to the fulfillment of the Emmanuel prophecy to show that this man, the son of Abraham, was no less than the son of God. In his verse, or his birth was fulfilling the promise of Isaiah chapter 7 where Emmanuel says God was going to be with us in, in the flesh, right? So the very first thing that um, Matthew's trying to do is he's setting up this fulfillment motif. He says Jesus is born true son of Abraham, but also now Messiah, true son of God. And then what does he do next? Um, he immediately jumps over uh, to the very next thing in his, uh, in his gospel, the Magi come to visit Jesus. And here you see the next, the next prophecy about the, the Messiah that Matthew points out is immediately fulfilled. 
Um, look at it, especially in verse five and six, very familiar words for us. Where's the Messiah to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, for this is what the prophet has written. You, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. So right away, um, what Matthew's saying is that Jesus is the Messiah, and as, as the son of David, which is the Messiah, uh, the Messiah must be, as the son of David, he was destined to be born in David's city. But then he shows us that the way in which these promises are going to be fulfilled is going to be different from what people expect. Because now the, the, the Davidic Messiah was born, the king was born in the city he was supposed to be born into, but this king lives in obscurity for two years after angels announced his birth. Um, he lives in obscurity and the nation of Israel doesn't care, but Gentiles are there to worship. Right. So then immediately, and you know how this story goes, immediately from there, the very next thing that happens in his gospel um, is he takes, oh, I just hit Apple TV, so we might get to watch some TV now. So I'm sorry about that. Um, the very next part of his gospel is, of course, the Magi uh, leave Herod behind. Herod doesn't get a chance to kill the child like he wanted to. And so he escapes to Egypt. And when they had gone, um, the uh, the uh, very next thing is um, God says, go down to Egypt um, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. He got up, took the child, left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of uh, Herod. And here again, so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. Uh, you can see how Matthew's going from fulfillment to fulfillment to fulfillment. And here's an example of one that here's a prophecy about Jesus that we never would have figured out without, um, without Matthew telling us. Because, um, you know, what we find out is that, of course, the children of Israel, um, they had originally gone to Egypt to be rescued from a famine because one of the 12 sons of Jacob, Joseph, became the vizier of Egypt. The family moves down there, but of course they stayed there New Pharaoh came, who'd forgotten what Joseph had done to save Egypt, and so the people, the children of Israel became enslaved, and then God brought them up out of Egypt in the great exodus, and that's where uh, the book of Exodus explains what Hosea prophesied many years later, where he talked about, out of Egypt I have called my son. Now, for all that we would know, until Matthew wrote these words, all that Hosea was talking about was the wonderful act that God did when he brought his child Israel up out of slavery into the promised land. But now here Matthew in his gospel, he immediately opens up a brand new understanding to us. He said that that prophecy of Hosea, um, out of Egypt I have called my son, it was fulfilled in the person of Jesus who went to Egypt and then came back to the land of Israel. And that's really fascinating. Because what it shows us is that Jesus is considered Israel reduced to one. That Jesus is the one first son of God who was going to do everything that Israel wasn't going to do. And so Israel, even its entire history, even its enslavement, um, even its great exodus back to the promised land, that was a picture of what God had in store when he was going to reduce Israel to one, in fact, reduce all of humanity to one, and then carry out through Jesus everything that you and I had failed to do, right? So that, that's just a really interesting fulfillment. And, and Matthew doesn't stop there. Um, right away, the very next thing in his gospel, of course, um, he goes to what happens with Herod and the, and the children, of course, right? Herod realized he's outwitted by the Magi. He ordered the slaughter of the innocents. Um, and then, and of course, all those two-year-old and under were slaughtered, those boys. And then immediately Matthew goes to another Old Testament prophecy that he says is being fulfilled in the life of Christ. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now, this is kind of an interesting one, and I think it's one that we need to uh, um, dig into a little bit to understand that, right? First of all, the idea there of um, 
remember who Rachel was, right? If I let me find a family tree down here, uh, I've got one on here. Family tree. So if you remember the family tree of the people of Israel, you had, uh, oops, I've got to share my screen. I'm sorry. If you come on, there it is. If you remember the family tree of the children of Israel, you had, of course, Abraham was the father of the nation, married to Sarah. Um, you had his son Isaac, that was the child of the promise, the child that had been uh, um, promised to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. Isaac married Rebekah, and Rebekah had two children, the twins, Esau and Jacob. And if you remember the story of Esau and Jacob, God, God promised that Jacob was good. The younger was going to inherit the, the, the blessing, not the older, Esau. And so Jacob was the child of the blessing. Um, he's also the one that is called, um, because he wrestled with God, he got the name Israel, which means wrestles with God. Um, and as you recall, Jacob married Leah and Rachel because he was tricked by evil Uncle Laban. Um, Rachel is seen as one of, as the as the mother of um, two of the tribes, you know Joseph and Benjamin, and uh, of course where um, where the city of Bethlehem is is um, inside the tribes that Rachel is the mother of. So, all that being said, when the Bible says a voice is heard in Rama, Rachel weeping for her children, um, what we're talking about is that the mother of the race there is uh is weeping and what this this is an interesting prophecy because we have to go back and look at it. this is actually coming from um jeremiah chapter 31 verse 15 and jeremiah 31 um says she's weeping for her children refusing to be comforted because they are no more okay what she was weeping over was the fact that uh jeremiah the prophet had prophesied that all the people of Israel were going to go into captivity in Babylon because of their disobedience, um, because of uh, everything, all the ways in which they turned away from God. And so in this prophecy, he, Jeremiah has Rachel weeping as the people go off to captivity. But now here's the, here's the really interesting thing. Um, remember how this story continues. Because, of course, um, Matthew shows us that that weeping of Rachel uh, at the sinful problems and the way in which the sinful world reacts to the Messiah's birth um, is a fulfillment of that Old Testament prophecy. But then um, remember what the Old Testament prophecy uh, had in all part of it. Um, that Matthew quotes just a couple of verses, but it's going to the point that he's going to make is that look at the rest of the prophecy. This is what the Lord says. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded. They will return from the land of the enemy, from captivity. So there's hope for your descendants, declare the Lord. Your children will return in their own land. This is the exact same chapter where, the, where God talks about the great compassion he has for his children. And then he says to them that he's going to make a new covenant with them. This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor, know the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So those words of sorrow from Jeremiah um, would have reminded the readers of Matthew's gospel that there was an overtone of hope there. They would remember what Jeremiah continued to say, and they would remember God's emotional yearning for his child, even while there was this wrath going on. And so what it would mean is they would be, have a chance to, uh, to yearn for the better days to come when the Lord himself is going to make a better covenant with his people. Right? And so this fulfillment thing that Matthew has going on, it just keeps going and going. The whole first part of his gospel is nothing but fulfillment. Look at the next one is... Uh, Chapter 2, verse 19, immediately jumps into it. Um, chapter 2, verse 19 says, um, let me, oops, I gotta get back to it. So uh, Herod dies, 
And Joseph, when he heard that, he had been warned in a dream, he withdrew to a district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. And so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. Um, now, of course, the troubling thing with this one is we really don't know what Old Testament passage Matthew's referring to when he talks about the fact that he'll be called a Nazarene. Uh, that that seems it's like a it's lost to us, but it certainly wasn't lost to Matthew's original um, hearers. We think it probably has a play on words in Hebrew that um, that would maybe uh, uh, be a reminder of the obscure nature of of the Messiah. And you know you can see that later on when. Uh, um, People say, "Hey, come see Jesus of Nazareth," and and people say, "Nazareth, what what good thing comes from Nazareth?" Um, it was just not not at all what God's people would have been expecting. Um, but then immediately he jumps into the next fulfillment, which is John the Baptist is on the scene. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And this is the one who's spoken through the prophet Isaiah, right? A voice in the one call, a voice of one calling. Um, the uh, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. So all of a sudden now the obscurity in which the Messiah was living was to be ended because here was another fulfillment that there would be a voice that would prepare the way that would show all the people that even though he lived in obscurity, had been raised in obscurity, he was different than what they had expected. Here was the Messiah, the one who was sent meets the fulfillment of every prophecy. And it's really awesome because then as soon as that sixth fulfillment happened, um, what do you see? Then, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. So the point there that uh, Matthew's making, of course, is that um, there is such a tremendous link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is the point of, of Matthew's gospel being placed first, because this is, this is the point that he's making. Um, Old Testament and New Testament fulfillment. And Matthew doesn't even get going with the rest of his gospel until he lets us see every one of those connections. So... I'll take a minute. I've been talking for a while. I want to see if there's uh, any questions. Brian, you still have your hand up, but I don't know if that's uh, on purpose or not. Um, <laughs> no, no questions. No, Brian? no. Okay, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lower your hand. Please do. Anybody else that has a question, you can unmute yourself and talk, or you can raise your hand, or you can wave at me. We can, we can all try to talk really loudly and wake up the Wamsley's baby. <laughs> okay. I'm going to, I will keep going then. All right. Um, let's take a look then at the very first few verses of our text for today. All right, so um, very first verse, it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Um, first thing that we have to notice here, of course, is there are three titles, or actually we could break it down to four titles for, um, for what we're calling this person, this genealogy, this, this, who this book is about. First of all, it's about Jesus. Um, Jesus, of course, um, is the first point that he's making that is that um, it's, it's his history, this person, Jesus of Nazareth. But already in the very first words of his gospel, um, by calling him Jesus, he invokes his saving purpose. Because, of course, Jesus in um, Hebrew would be Joshua or Yeshua. And Yeshua means the Lord saves. Um, of course, jo the first Joshua in the Bible was the successor to Moses, who brings God's people into the promised land. Um, the true and better Joshua is this son of Israel, who God said when his birth was announced, he will save his people from their sins. So the very first words is reminding us of the saving purpose of Jesus. Then he calls us, he uh, reminds us of the title Messiah. Um, just a quick reminder about Messiah. Um, the word Messiah means the anointed one. 
means the one who was uh, set apart by God to save his people from their sins. And um, when we say that word in Greek, we say Christos, or the word Christ. When we say that word in Hebrew, we say Mashiach, or Messiah. So the word Messiah and Christ are the same thing. Um, they both mean the anointed one. So when we talk about um, the, the title for Jesus in the Bible, um, you'll see, see the word Messiah and Christ used interchangeably because they're just uh, different languages, but the same word. Um, so when we talk about people who are messianic, that means they're a Christian. Um, they're focused on the Christ, the, the, uh, the Christos. And uh, I think the really important point of this is that um, we need to talk about what were the expectations that um, God's people had for the Messiah. Um, I, you know, first of all, they did have, oops, first of all, they certainly had political expectations. Um, many people wanted to um, see the old kingdom of David restored and the Romans thrown out. But, you know, as you read in the uh, contemporary literature of the period, you find out that not everybody was looking for a political messiah. Um, there were a lot of people that were looking for a spiritual messiah, too. A messiah who would restore God's kingdom um, and restore God's peace, or God's peace in a spiritual sense. Um, but really what uh, Matthew is doing by saying that this is the genealogy of Jesus, the messiah, he's really saying, um, that number one, God's chosen this man to do what the Messiah had, was promised to do, which is to bring judgment and salvation. Secondly, um, he says that by calling him Jesus the Messiah, he's saying this man is inaugurating a new age of salvation that begins with him. And third of all, by saying this man, Jesus, is the Messiah, he's reminding everyone that he's going to be the kind of Messiah that's not going to conform with the expectations of the Jewish people uh, in any way, shape, or form. So the, the third title that he has for, for Jesus is the son of Abraham. And of course, the son of Abraham's an important, uh, an important reference because what, um, what Matthew's making the point of is that Jesus is the goal and the high point of God's dealing with Israel. So he's not just the high point of his dealing, with, but he's the focus, he's the goal, he's the direction for all of his dealing with Israel. So like, if you think about uh, uh, Abraham, he was, of course, the father of the nation of Israel. He was a great patriarch, and the whole nation of Israel descended from him. And when Jesus is called here the son of Abraham, Matthew's reminding us that Jesus, this son of Israel, fulfilled all God's promises to Israel, but also he had come for another reason too, not just for Israel. Remember Genesis chapter 12? Uh, let me pull that up. Uh, I think I will. Nope. Genesis chapter 12. I guess I didn't look that one up already. Genesis chapter 12 is when God comes to Abraham and he begins by making him promises. And uh, one of the promises that's really important is that he said, I will make you into a great nation. This is verse two, and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So a really important aspect of the promises made to Abraham is it's not just Abraham and his children who will be blessed through them. Whereas instead, this is also um, Jesus is the son of Israel who fulfills God's promises for the salvation of the Gentiles too. And for the salvation of the Gentiles, that was, uh, that was one of these promises that the New Testament church had to, had to have unpacked by the Holy Spirit because they had just so, gotten so far away from seeing the Gentiles as being part of God's plan for salvation. They just absolutely forgot about this amazing um, promise that from the very beginning, from the time that Abraham was given the promise, it was meant for his people, his descendant, that seed, uh, to be a blessing for all people. And you really see that come to its um, climax in this gospel according to St. Matthew. He sets it up here at the beginning in the very first verse, right? Son of Abraham. And it comes to its conclusion, its climax, at the very end of Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 28, when he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Right? And so that great commission that comes at the very end of Matthew's gospel, it very naturally is a bracket for this message because that's exactly how he began it, reminding people that Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Um, you know, I, I think I skipped son of David. That's probably important for us to talk about. Um, you know, son of David, again, let me bring up that, uh, that screen. I think I skipped son of David. Um, you know, the promises of the Messiah were given first, of course, to Abraham, but then they were passed down to David's household, and that David would be um, the the line of through which the Savior would come. And these these two references here, Second Samuel and First Chronicles, are God's promise that um, David was going to have a son who would sit on his throne and reign forever and ever, a kingdom that will never end. Um, that was the the messianic promise that the Davidic kingship would be reestablished in this one person, this one true son of Israel, in which God would bring the fulfillment of all of his promises to fruition. And so in that first verse, I, I think uh, Matthew is saying so much, I mean, in just, just a couple of words, uh, Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, he's got the, the plan laid out for his entire gospel from one end to the other, and then he just jumps into fulfillment with it. Um, let's see. Oh, are there any questions or anybody um, have anything they want to talk or say? Oh, I see Al. I'm going to unmute Al. Go ahead. Uh, so, but the the Jews from their uh, old their ancient scriptures they they fully recognize the concept of Messiah, right? Yes, absolutely. Was, it was was the, were the did the prophecies name him as messiah or how, how did how did they know how did they tie that together yeah they it actually named him as messiah Ma Ma mashiach as the messiah the anointed one who was to come it, the, the messiah had a lot of titles um but so even like uh, uh the coming one was a title of the messiah we sing that every sunday or every other sunday in the uh in the holy 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 blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord that's the coming one that's the that was a messianic title Another messianic title would be things like the Son of Man. Um, that was there's a reason Jesus used that title. Um, he wanted to make sure everybody knew exactly what he meant. Yeah. Great question. One of my very favorite uh, things is when John the Baptist says, "Behold the Lamb of God." I mean, that is just so cool. Yeah, that you know that was. Uh, that was a whole, uh, that was 1,500 years of sacrifices at the temple that were getting God's people ready um, to see an innocent substitute uh, that would, it would, to see the lamb God was going to bring to temple. Um, that wouldn't just uh, point ahead to a sacrifice to come, but would be the sacrifice that was needed to take away all of our sins. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Al. Um, I'm looking if anybody else is waving or wants to say anything now. Okay. Um, let's take a look then for a second at this, the, uh, the genealogy itself. Um, and, uh, I want you to just, if you have your Bibles open there, um, I th well, I'll, I'll put, I'll put it up on the screen as well. Um, I want you to just take a look at that genealogy. You've probably seen it, uh, maybe before, maybe you haven't, but genealogies are, they, they have a lot of cool things to say. Um, they were a very important, important thing that this Matthew takes up an awful lot of screen space uh, in to use today's terminology uh, to talk about what the genealogy of Jesus is and the reason for it a couple of things maybe for us to note first of all this is a uh, I guess we'd call this today a highlight reel this is not um, listing absolutely everyone that in, in the in the generations from um, <clears throat> from Abraham to Jesus so uh, there are some of these where so-and-so was the ancestor of so-and-so, where there are generations that are skipped in there. You know, maybe like if you've got a weird uncle, um, you know, Uncle Ralph or something like that, you don't like to mention him, you skip him when you talk about family history. Um, the, uh, they didn't, it's, it's a highlight reel. And it's also then, we're going to find out it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of constructed. Um, uh, Matthew picks it uh, in a couple of ways for the reason, but you know, kind of the point that you're gonna that I want you to take a look at here is, you know, remember how we said there were those three sections, 
from Abraham to King David was the first one. And so that's the story of um, the very first time the people of God were given this promise in, the na in what was to become the nation of Israel. It found its fulfillment, of course, in the, uh, in the person of King David, um, the man after God's own heart, uh, the man who would be the future uh, ancestor of the Savior. The next arc goes from David through all the kings of Judah, the, so the good ones and the very, very bad ones, and ends with Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers, at the time of the exile to Babylon. That was the great point of humiliation for the nation of Israel. Remember, this meant that their royal line had been cut off, um, that this, uh, this house of Jesse, as it was called, or house of David, was like a tree that had been cut off and all that was left was a stump. And, uh, the, uh, and uh, after the exile to Babylon, the next uh, arc goes from exile to the birth of Jesus. And as you look through these three areas, you see all of God's uh, dealings with mankind, and especially with the people of Israel, and everything that went before it that finally uh, met its goal in the person of Jesus. And it reminds us again that Israel was a people with a purpose. And uh, what Matthew's doing, but he sets it up with these three sets of 14. Um, 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to, the to exile, 14 from the exile to Christ. Um, he's, he's showing that um, history tells us that it was under God's control. But if that's the case, um, you know, what are we learning about the Messiah and God's plan if all of this was underneath God's control? I mean, here you've got uh, the story of a nation made great and then a nation made terribly humble and then a royal line that goes into complete obscurity. It finally ends with someone named Joseph, whose only reason why anybody would even know his name is because he was pledged to be married to an equally obscure woman named Mary. Um, I think that really helps us understand some things about the people that are mentioned then in this genealogy, because it's going to show us that God's plan and the way in which he works in the world um, is, uh, is completely different from what we'd expect. Right? So now, one of the things that people often notice on uh, this genealogy that's that's kind of surprising is in a, a world that's all about um, uh, lineage through the, the oldest son, what you end up seeing in four places here are women mentioned. Tamar, Rahab, Uriah's wife. And where did I go? I missed one. Uh, I, missed, where I think you skipped oh, Ruth. Right there. Ruth. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and Ruth. Now, what's interesting is four women are mentioned there. If you were going to pick who the Israelites would have listed for their four women in their, um, in their big genealogy, the Messiah, I mean, who would they have picked? It would not have been these, right? I mean, I guess if I were going to say who would, who uh, Jewish folks would have picked, they would have probably picked um, the four mothers of their race, of their of their tribe: Sarah, the wife of Abraham; Rebecca, the wife of Isaac; Leah and Rachel, the wives of Israel, that led to the twelve tribes of Israel. That would make sense. Um, but instead, um, here we have four women that are completely surprised. Um, surprising in a, in a bunch of different ways. Um, you know, but I do think it's interesting that each of them arrive at a very um, pivotal time in Israel's history. So, for example, um, Tamar. Tamar, oops, I can't write. Tamar is actually the uh, uh, daughter of Judah down here. Um, it's a pretty sordid tale there um, that involved uh, Judah not doing what he was supposed to and his brothers not doing what they're supposed to. And this woman, uh, unfortunately, being, you know, sleeping with her father and then about to be getting burned to death. And it was all a big mess. Um, so Tamar is a name that is surprising that she'd be in this list, uh, except here she is. And I think it's interesting. She's right at the, at the, uh, at, in the house of the tribe of Judah's ancestors. So all of, remember, the Messiah is going to descend from um, the tribe of Judah. 
And actually, the amazing thing is, not just descend from the uh, tribe of Judah, but the, the Savior is going to descend to the line of Tamar. So Judah and Tamar gave birth to Perez. Perez gave birth to all the rest of these. And uh, the uh, you have Ruth, of course, or Rahab, I should say. Rahab was the prostitute that was at Israel's entry into the promised land, but she was brought also into the line of the Savior. Ruth, of course, uh, she was right in the middle of the history of the house of the coming king because um, her, her husband was part of this, this house through which the king would come. And of course, Bathsheba um, was inside of the house of David itself. But it's interesting in this um, genealogy, Bathsheba's name is not even mentioned. Um, she's simply called, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Uh, it's a, a reminder again that um, in the Bible, God doesn't whitewash over the sin of the, the leaders of God's people. Um, it's right there in bold relief. But, you know, think about those four women now. Um, and what do they tell us about this list? And maybe what do they even tell us about um, the last woman named on that list, Mary? You know, Mary didn't have, uh, didn't have any of these public sins like some of the other ones did. Um, she was under a cloud, though. I mean, in the society in which she was when she was pregnant without a husband. Um, but more than anything else, I think what it shows us is that um, these four women, what they have in common is that they're all surprises. And that really is what you see when you get to the end of this genealogy and you find out that um, Joseph was the husband of Mary and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is the Messiah. Mary had, uh, had she wasn't rich, she wasn't powerful, she wasn't connected. Um, all she was is she found favor with God. And, you know, when you, when you hear Mary's song, um, you know, you see, you see firsthand how God's plan for the Messiah was going to be about reversals, about, um, about lifting up the lowly and casting down the mighty. And that's, uh, I think, really going to be a, a theme that we're going to come back to again and again here in Matthew. So um, finally, a couple other things about this uh, why 14 generations and all from Abraham, 14 from David to the exile? Why, why would, because there's more than 14 generations there, um, and this is a highlight reel, why did, um, why did Matthew choose 14 from each? Um, it could be a form of gematria. So gematria is where you take and uh, you put a, a number to go with a letter for every letter of the alphabet. So this is, this is the Hebrew alphabet. Um, I, and uh, if you take a look, like, so that up here, it goes down this way. So Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit, He, Vav, Zion. And then they would just put uh, numbers with them. So Aleph would be worth one or Beit would be worth two. Uh, and then you calculate, you calculate what words are worth. So for example, if we took a look at that, what would this word number be down at the bottom? Um, so this is a D, a Dalit. This is a Vav, another Dalit. So, nope, let me turn on it. Of course, uh, this, this word right there, that's David's name. Uh, the name is David and his Gematria number is, um, of course, 14. So that, that's one thought why people say why there's, a, there's 14 generations as he's gonna set that up is that he's using this He's using the, this picture of uh, that, you know, here is the central um, point of the genealogy is the son of David has come here, 14, 14, 14. Um, the other option is that um, when the first genealogy was given in the book of Chronicles, um, and it goes from Abraham to David, um, it gives it as 14. And it doesn't list the rest of the generations there, obviously. But then the other option is that Matthew used that because he knew the scripture well and said, there were 14 there, I'm going to do 14 and 14. We don't really know, but that's, those are a couple of ideas. Um, let me see. Oh, uh, this is probably important. People might ask this. Um, if you actually count the generations um, up here in the, in the genealogy, the last set, 
from Babylon to Jesus, if you actually count them the way you count the other ones, there is there is 13, not 14. And people say, well, why is that? How, how does this work? Well, there's a couple of different things as to why it looks like there's 13 here, not 14. The most frequently and most likely one is um, right in the text itself, where the where Matthew talks about exile to Babylon in verse 11 and exile to Babylon in verse 12. That was such a, uh, a striking moment in Israelite history that Matthew wanted to count it twice. And so that's what most people would say is that's how the 14th generation is. The Babylonian captivity generation is counted twice. Humility on top of humility. Finally, the last thing I have there is if you read another genealogy, if you open up to Matt or the book of Luke, um, you'll see that the book of Luke has got uh, significantly different names in it. Um, some, some of the names, uh, most of the names that happen between the um, Babylonian captivity and the birth of Jesus are significantly different. Um, there's some that are shared and some that aren't. There's a lot of different ways that people have tried to uh, explain what the difference is in those genealogies. Um, the really simple explanation that we think is, um, so Matthew's gospel is concerned explicitly with um, Jesus and his fulfillment as son of David, son of Abraham. He really doesn't spend any time on Mary. Uh, in fact, like when we read Matthew chapter one there, the uh, what was the point of the Christmas narrative in Matthew? It was the angel appearing to Joseph saying, hey, Joseph, you son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. This is, the, this is what it promised. Whereas Luke, um, Luke obviously spent a lot of time with Mary. And so the Gospel of Luke would get the Christmas narrative from Mary's perspective. And so the most natural explanation for Luke's genealogy in chapter 3 um, is that Luke is giving us the genealogy of Mary, and Matthew gives us the genealogy of Joseph. And so, um, the, and the whole point, of course, is that Jesus needed both his stepfather and his real mother to be descended from David. And so that's the most likely reason for that and the uh, most likely explanation. So that is more time than you probably have ever, oh, I see Dawn. Okay, hey, hang on, unmute, Mrs. Hill. Okay, the other thing is Luke goes all the way back to Adam. And the one in Matthew doesn't go that far back. Correct, yeah, absolutely. Um, How and, come? Well, because Luke would, well, Luke, the point of Matthew's is Jesus is Israel reduced to one. And Israel got its start with Abraham. Abraham, And okay. And what uh, Luke was telling us about is that um, this Messiah um, goes all, the promise goes all the way back. And I, I think it's because, again, he focuses much more on Mary. And so he takes the story all the way back to the first mother that we all had takes it all the way back to Eve, um, this woman whose uh, whose name Chava means life because is her husband saw that she would be the her womb would be the source of life for the world in a world that was uh, uh, plunged into darkness and death. Okay. Any questions you guys have? That is the sum total of how far I was going to go tonight. Um, my suggestion uh, is for this next week, uh, maybe read through chapters one, two, and three of Matthew and uh, take a little bit of time to uh, um, digest some of that stuff and uh, be thinking about Old Testament prophecy, New Testament fulfillment. Uh, take the time to jump back and forth a little bit and uh, look up those Old Testament prophecies. So. Well, I am all done, so I'm going to unmute everybody. And anybody who wants to talk, feel free. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you This is more like it. <laughs> I feel more like I've been to church now. Good, Al. Amen to that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard not having anybody here. Uh, Great big empty building I'm in right now. Yeah. <laughs> and getting bigger. And getting bigger. That's right. <laughs> Pastor, Pastor, thanks for setting this up. This is just super. Absolutely, yeah. Al. I've never used Zoom before, and this is just fantastic. It works pretty easily, right? I mean, I think yeah. most people had it. No. Wasn't too bad. Yeah. No, it was good. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. You have a great night. All right, you guys too.
I know. Everybody. Great oh. job. No Thanks, Pastor. Have a good night. Absolutely. Would you send Thank out you like a recording of it or the um, handouts yes. that you have? Okay. Yeah, I can. I can send out a recording of it. It'll. It's automatically recording. For right. Us. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. How do I hang up? <laughs> you can me. just close the window if you if you want to hang up. That's right. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank so, you, Al. That's a show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I hear Noah. Uh, I hear Ethan. Noah. Where's that Ethan? Is that Ethan? Is that show. Say hi to everyone. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, Pastor and uh, Wamsley's, uh, it was just so nice to be able to see Landon's baptism. Oh, pretty that awesome. Was, that was nice. So they had to they had to dodge an awful lot of construction equipment to get in there. <laughs> sure. It was very cool. Hey Noah. Hey, Noah. Noah. Hello. Hey buddy. <laughs> See you all. See you yeah. night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye bye now. Hey. <laughs> Hello, granddaddy. Hello. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. What kind of juice boxes are those? We can ask him later when we're not in here. Okay. Right. <laughs>